Outside the continent of Africa, it's common to hear that Africans live in mad hats. This statement often aims at painting and stereotyping Africa as a primitive continent that is not capable of erecting structures like those found in other parts of the world. In fact, to most people that have never studied or learned about Africa's architecture, the idea that impressive architectural structures exist on the continent outside Egypt is a difficult concept to grasp. Sadly and unfortunately, this view about Africa is understandable because it isn't fundamentally false. It is simply outdated and incomplete. Before the world learned more about Africa, specifically Sub-Sahara Africa, it knew about the pyramids of Egypt. In fact, Western architecture draws a lot of inspiration from ancient Egypt. And this can be seen in Greek and Roman architecture that adopted the columns, pediments, and cornices that was in ancient Egypt's monumental structures. Aside Egypt, the world knew little to nothing about the structures below the Sahara until Europeans started exploring the continent in the 15th century. Even then, it wasn't until the 18th and 19th century that structures below the Sahara were documented. And during these documentations, Sub-Sahara Africa was recorded to have its inhabitants living in mud huts and other structures made from sticks and thatch. These documentations have since become what African architecture is associated with. While not a complete lie because various parts of Africa still have mud huts, it disregards the variety of Africa's architecture and the advancement it's made in incorporating modern styles. But even more importantly, the mad hats that is often mentioned to portray Africa as a primitive continent disregards why people in Africa built and continue to build these structures. To understand this, we need to briefly talk about the history of architecture. The history of architecture is the history of survival. After all, it's part of the four things humans need in order to survive on this floating planet we call Earth. Without shelter, avoiding the elements would be an impossible task. From the beginning, humans looked for anything that would offer protection, and caves were the best option around. But caves are very limiting. While some caves were in areas with a high concentration of food and water, often, most caves had neither, and so there was always a need to venture farther away to get food and water. And so, a need to have something else that wasn't caves became a priority. Across the globe and independently, early humans started building structures out of whatever material was available, and they all tackled weather conditions in different ways. Mud huts were specifically built to keep the people in them cool, and this is why in every single part of the world that receives a lot of sunlight, structures built out of mud were more common. But we humans are very artistic. So, we eventually started making bricks out of mud and clay and left them out in the sun or placed them in fires to harden. Once hardened, the variety of structures built was only limited by the imagination of the architect. Egyptians, for instance, used them to build the numerous structures revered all over the globe. The Romans followed suit and did the same. Further advancements were made, and soon there was concrete and cement, both of which made constructing shelter easier. But, for some reason, while various parts of the world adopted building with these new materials, some parts of Africa stuck with building out of mud and clay, and this continues to this day. In fact, there's a resurgence in using mud and clay in African architecture that is being spearheaded by Francis Carey, a Pritzker Prize-winning architect that has built numerous and fantastic structures out of a combination of clay, mud, and other sustainable and locally sourced materials across Africa. These structures he's building take inspiration from traditional structures that were built in Africa before its colonization. The structures built in Africa before colonization start us off in North Africa. Most people know of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, and some people know of the Nubian Pyramids of Sudan. These impressive structures were all constructed some 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. But unlike the mass structures below the Sahara, these pyramids were built with rocks that were cut into varying shapes and sizes. Below the Sahara is the Bandiagara Escarpment in Mali, which contains the dwellings of the Dogon and Telem people. These structures were made from mud, clay, and sand, all of which are plentiful in the area. 
Then there's the Moxum mud huts built by the Moxum people in the northern part of Cameroon. Dotted around West, East and Central Africa are round huts, which is typically what most people think of when they think of mud huts in Africa. But rotating back to Mali, there's this incredible structure that was built sometime in the 13th century called the Great Mosque of Jene and sometimes referred to as the Great Mad Mosque of Jene. This building is within the sudano sahelian architectural style and this style contains the largest structures in sub-Sahara Africa. Unlike the pyramids in Northern Africa, these structures are composed entirely of mud, clay and varying assortments of wood and straw. These mud structures and dwellings in sub-Sahara Africa were built with the intent to keep the inside cool and they do so extremely effectively. They have a relatively high thermal mass which means they can take a beating from the sun but maintain a cool interior during the day and a warm interior as the temperature drops during the night. For sub-Sahara Africa, structures like this are crucial since modern buildings are environmentally unsustainable and expensive. The high temperatures in Africa also make modern buildings uncomfortably hot due to the extremely high thermal mass of concrete and it requires energy costs to cool it that most African families can't afford. As a result of this, alternatives are being welcomed and has led to a resurgence in traditional architecture. As mentioned earlier, Francis Kerr is spearheading this. He's built numerous structures around Africa that uses local materials like clay and mud and are built to have passive cooling systems through the use of overhanging roofs and wide windows. These structures not only blend into the environment better than modern buildings, but they also build and improve upon traditional structures that were the norm before colonization. Two of these improvements is highlighted in the use of large overhanging roofs and drainages. Both assist in protecting the buildings from rain, which would normally weaken the integrity of the mud structures. This pivot from modern architecture is often met with pushback because while these traditional buildings are better suited for the environment and blend into the landscape better, they often require more maintenance and use materials that make it harder to build them as high rises. But the benefits outweigh these issues since a developing Africa will want to avoid the same mistakes other continents have made in overusing materials like concrete. For a continent that is already too hot, using less concrete will help prevent the creation of urban heat islands since structures made from concrete soak and retain heat at a higher level than mud. This shift will also provide the world a better image of what African architecture is as the continent embraces and improves upon the traditional structures often used as a means to portray it as primitive.